Good morning. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing okay. Can't complain. Things are all right around here. Let me just see if I can shed a little bit more light on the subject. Oh, man, that is so philosophical, hey? <laughs> <laughs> just can't get away from it, can you? <laughs> where, where, where does the metaphor of, I mean, look, I mean, I have my, my, my speculations, uh, actually even rooted in biology, but the the metaphor of light. I mean, what you know? Where does it emerge? Oh, you went into darkness, ah. Bill. Well, I'm going to Bill, turn. what's happening? There we go. Is that better? You're you're you've gone to dark the dark side though. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is. So the metaphor of light is that human beings, as well as many other animals, have an advantage over plants and minerals in that they can perceive stuff that's far away from them. Now, we, um, plants can also perceive stuff that's far away from them if, if through um, <clears throat> stuff floating in the air that they, they can detect and so forth. But animals, including humans, have the ability to see stuff that's far away and move around such that they can do something with what they perceive, avoid it or pursue it or make a use of it or whatever. This has just come straight from Aristotle. Plants have that ability. And so it gives us more power, more ability to get things done. That's my definition of power, the, the ability to get things done. And so light, as you said, light on something, it makes it more accessible, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really where the metaphor comes from. Mm. And it kind of overlooks the fact that there are certain, mm, certain useful and powerful things that happen in the dark. So you don't want to just be in the light all the time. You want to have some darkness so you can sleep. And then, of course, the roots of plants exist in the dark. So it's so from a yin and yang balance thing but by and large we prefer light for being able to maneuver our way around reality and get things done and achieve our goals and that kind of thing well and then there's also got to be a i mean there's a very pagan ritualistic uh light coming on light coming off the cycles of sleep yeah. to light mm -hmm. seasons to uh winter seasons uh, to summer seasons, yeah, springtime, fall, just had, death, we, birth, we renewal, did, right? We just had the equinox, in which days are equal in length. So like days and nights are equal in length. And now, and we in the northern hemisphere here are going toward a position of the days are getting longer, nights are getting shorter. In the southern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. Days are getting shorter. Nights are getting longer. It's the way it works. Just, just physically, the way that Earth is kind of tilted and the sun hits it and so forth. Um, but one of the things that our contemporary culture, I say that there's lots of cultures, but there's sort of a global culture influenced largely by the West, is that we've lost touch with the natural cycles. So we all go, okay, it's the equinox, and nobody goes, well, what does that mean? Um, it means it's spring is here, summer is coming on. The interesting thing, so two things. One is that it's it's more it's useful for us, it's more healthy for us to be in touch with the natural cycles. You get totally away from natural cycles. I was once in uh, Reno, Nevada. And Nevada is a big gambling state, and Reno is no different. Lots of hotels and stuff. You go down in the basement of the hotels, and all of a sudden, you're in this monster plaza thing that spans different buildings. It's this huge monster thing, and people are in this artificial environment, and they're pulling um, the handles of slot machines, and they're playing dice games and gambling and all this stuff. And it's completely artificial. And there was there would be no way you would know is it daylight outside or night? No difference at all. And that is designed to keep people there 
gambling away their money because the house always wins right in the long run so you're there and you're just you're going to lose your money even though you're having some kind of fun doing it and so it's it's unnatural it's like it's a way to manipulate people into doing things that they might not otherwise do so the more in my humble opinion the more we can get out in nature and notice the actual cycles of nature the more grounded we get the more we are um, we're released from the artificial stuff that goes on that that causes us to have aberrant behavior and aberrant thoughts and just makes us crazy in some ways yeah yeah um i wanted to, i want to touch on a couple points uh you know there's a lot that you said it's you're we're lucky that it's the morning and i've got my coffee and uh you know these types of things so um in in, in a matter of appearance let's look at two items i think you really i'd like to spend some time today talking about um uh about the situation in ukraine okay uh what, you know how you're philosophically approaching it and a humanitarian from a humanitarian standpoint or from a geopolitical standpoint, I'd be really interested to hear uh, how, how you're approaching that, what you're thinking about it. Um, and we've touched on this before. So I'm going to throw three things. Okay. So we've touched on this before, um, but the ability to be able to do work is what you define as power. This is great. This is really good. Um, uh, I'd like, I'd like you to talk about that in the various forms of power. You actually even have an opportunity to, to pull some of that doing uh, potential, okay, into into your uh, your thoughts about Ukraine, into the uh, the geo uh, political reality that we're 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 now we now find our, ourselves in. Um, the the final one is isn't really related. Might might be something you can knock off right away, um, but the interconnectivity of our biodiversity. So I'm thinking of um, of trees, for example. So, um, and I'm, I'm really have no idea. Maybe you have no idea either. But um, do 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 trees in a forest? Do they do they actually somehow work together? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's I, I just read a book by uh, a woman who is a forester in BC, and I don't remember the title of the book or the woman's name, but she has this whole book about how um, stands of trees actually communicate underground through networks of um, mycelium, fungal networks. They can send signals back and forth, uh, molecular signals and so forth. And they work to together to promote everybody's health and the health of all the, the trees. She's done a lot of research on what kind of trees will grow where and in the company of what other trees. If something, it's, it's pretty well known, if something uh, impacts a plant negatively, there's a threat to it in some ways. Somehow other plants nearby know about it and start producing defenses. Like an insect attacks one tree. Well, the other trees will start making chemical defenses so the insect won't be as prone to, to attack them. And so there's ways trees and, and plants communicate with each other. It's pretty much invisible to the naked eye for human beings, but it's every, everything's connected. And this relates to our place in the universe. Our place is that we are embedded in nat natural environments. Everything's connected to everything else. Our actions have an impact on our surroundings and our surroundings have an impact on us. And that that's just a fact about how things work. And people ignore that fact. They can um, do industrial agriculture and wipe out all the species except one monoculture. And then after a while, they have to do more and more chemical stuff to you fend off the predators of that one monoculture, whereas if there had been uh, diversity, the predators would have been taken care of. They wouldn't have been eliminated, but they would have been managed better. There's a, uh, they have to truck in 
bees, beehives, so that the bees will go out and pollinate the plants. Well, if you had the plant the bees' natural habitat nearby or surrounding the fields of ag that you're trying to grow your crop, you wouldn't have to truck in bees. The bees would already be there. There's, so there's lots of ways modern civilization has sort of divorced itself from its connection with nature. But nature has the last word. Um, nature, nature's, you can't just overwhelm nature. Nature is going to come back and, and and bite you if you do something that's not just not going to work. So this has to do with my fundamental ethical guidelines that it's a really good idea to maximize the benefit of all concerned, all the people around you, all the plants and animals, the natural systems, because we're all connected. Once you have a healthy growing ecosystem, everything in the ecosystem thrives. So if you try to maximize one part of it and ignore the rest of it, then the rest of it interferes. It just doesn't work as well. So nowadays there's, um, people know about the solstices and equinoxes because it's pretty easy. Days are equal nights and so forth. And they say, oh, the equinox we just had in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a spring equinox. Well, guess what? Spring started earlier than the equinox. There's this other thing called cross quarters in between the, the uh, equinoxes and the solstices. The solstices are where there's maximum light in the Northern Hemisphere, minimum light in the Southern Hemisphere. In between, there's a thing called cross quarter. It's halfway in between, astrologically. And that's that it's it's not as easy to to detect. I mean, you can tell that the, the days are getting longer and the days are getting shorter, but what halfway in between is kind of fuzzy. But those are real crucial places that that's when things that in a sense, that's when spring actually starts. Things start to bud out, things start to grow more, not before the equinox, but halfway between more or less. And this has been known to um, so-called primitive cultures, agricultural cultures for sure, for thousands of years, maybe more. We were in tune with that. So if we're gonna wanna maximize our mental health and our physical health, it's a good idea to pay attention to those things. And that, uh, there's a certain artificiality in dividing it up only into the solstice and equinoxes. It's more organic and helpful to notice the cross quarters as well. So I forget where I was going with that. Ask me another question. <laughs> well, there was the, the, the lead in. Well, that was perfect. Great, great response. Um, but I'd, I'd like to now shift the, the conversation to um, the reality in Ukraine, uh, how mm -hmm. you're approaching it. Uh, and of course, probably, I think it would be appropriate to weave in um, your definition of power as defined as and measured by doing. Well, I say power is the ability to get things done. Okay. And there's lots of ways to do that. You can, there's, there's um, some people have talked about power over and power from within. Power over is what Russia is attempting to do to Ukraine. Send in a lot of tanks and bombs and guns and just obliterate stuff and make people submit to your will. Power from within is when we, um, we get in touch with and, and exercise our personal power and cooperate with other people. And it's, not, it's, it's more subtle in a way than just beating somebody over the head. But in the long run, it's more effective. Gets things if you if you really want to. I mean, it's it's hard to tell what Putin actually wants. He's demented. He, he's um, he's somehow a damaged human being. If he really wanted to enhance the welfare of his country and his people, he wouldn't. 
go bombing Ukraine. He'd have trade with Ukraine. He'd, um, he'd promote cooperation and working together. So how you deal with somebody like that, I don't, I don't have a clue. I'm not a politician. I mean, the way I'm dealing personally with Ukraine is I sent some money to organizations that help uh, send medical supplies to the area and, and help children and so forth. There's ways that we can do that. And I certainly encourage politically the, um, the West basically to stand up against Putin, however that, but the details of that, are we going to shoot down Russian MiGs? Oh, they'll get us into a shooting war with Russia and all the rest of us instead of just Ukraine. So apparently what we're doing is just providing arms to Ukraine and have them shoot down the missiles. I, that's not my area of expertise. I, I, I don't know. I don't have an idea about what's the best way to deal with Putin. I have fantasies about, you know, I'm, I have a magic powers and I make him die. <laughs> you just flick him off the, you just, you just squish him like a bug. <laughs> Something like that. But those, fan, those are only fantasies. So how you do it, deal with it in the, in the real world, I don't know. Except that it, this, this thing sort of illustrates, and, it, and, and this is something that Putin apparently has overlooked. Before Putin attacked Ukraine, their NATO was kind of, kind of, sort of, not quite in a shambles, but not very unified. The, the Western European nations, you know, they were, they were the, the will to cooperate and so forth was was not as not quite as strong. When Putin tracks Ukraine, which is like four hours from Berlin, and right up against Poland. All of a sudden, Western nations, bam, strengthen NATO. Become, he's, Putin now has a much stronger opposition in Western Europe than he did before he attacked Ukraine. Now, I, I can't believe he wouldn't have known that, but maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't take that into consideration. I have no idea. The guy's nuts. You know, I mean, he's very clever, uh, but he's but he's but he's not smart if you know what i mean he's 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 clever he's not even very clever though his, his army doesn't appear to have the uh, the power that he thought it did so his only response is oh i want to take over mariupol okay so let's just bomb the hell out of it and kill a bunch of civilians what is the point i mean so maybe he kills all the civilians and then he has the place um but it's in a rubbles yes it, it's just if his if his goal is to strengthen the country of Russia, say he's not doing a very smart job. Of, he's not doing it well because uh, it's uh, promoting the opposition. But this is this is pretty much standard in a lot of ways. It's the Chinese philosophy of the yin and yang. If as yang grows, yin diminishes, but then there's a point where yin grows and yang diminishes. It just goes back and forth. You never achieve a stasis. This is um, the part of Chinese philosophy, ever, the Tao Te Ching and you know, it's Confucius and all that. And it's like there's a, there's a rhythm, there's a cycle. And if you try to push the rope, so to speak, if you try to push against the, against the river, but to push against the cycle, it, it's, you run into trouble. It makes more difficulty for you. Um, so I don't know what Putin's up to. Like I say, he's nuts. And obviously the West has to put a stop to it in some way, the specific tactics and strategies of how to do that. I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, there's some to say that he's 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 an incarnation of a fallen angel, and so um, I mean I know you're not going to like this, you know, entirely. From, it's it's more of a religious bend, but well, um, okay. it's uh, you know this idea of the fallen angel, and then the mm -hmm. the definition and the forming of the good actually happens as a result of the evil that he perpetrates. So he does more good as evil to form <laughs> right to form the good uh -huh. and galvanize the side of the good. Because right. we can take up arms and and have, um, 
uh, a, 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 a unified world direction that is against, well, it's, it's kind of an East and a West sort of thing. I think there's some, maybe some, um, some support from Hungary for, for, for Russia. And I think uh, China's still on the fence, mm. but um, we're, we're in an interesting perspective, both you and I, because we're, we're from the West, right? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I value, uh, I, I I value the um, the freedoms that we have in the West. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I'm with you. And yet, here here we here we sit, staring at a hockey stick graph. Okay, mm-hmm. And I'm referring to Michael Mann's explosion yeah. of What's up? right. And I think who is disproportionately responsible for the destruction of the planet mm. we in the west the industrial well industrialized countries in generally holy and shit bill plenty plenty of plenty of pollution and stuff in russia as well in the east and now yeah. more and more in china it's the industrialization and the and the absence of working with natural systems if you try to dam up a river well okay so you've got lots of water and power and so forth but after a while it silts up and you have to do more work and maybe the dam breaks and boom you have a disaster it's like like working with natural cycles is more effective in the long run than working against them even though in the short run you get more immediate results Hmm. that makes sense yeah what are your thoughts about uh this this idea of new world order globalism as an unattainable uh, utopia uh, versus un- nationalistic un- tendencies and stuff like this. I don't, I don't know what new world order means. So I'm a little, mm. I'm okay. a little hazy there. So I don't know. It, it's, I, I think it's a term that's kind of thrown uh, against the uh, neoliberal NATO expansionist, you know, type of thinking um, that a, that world governments are uh, unattainable, that, um, yeah, we can leave it at that. So that, 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 that a, a, a world approach to governance is not possible. Um, and, you know, do you, do you think we could pull that off? Do you think we can have uh, worldwide? Like one, like one government for the whole world, like, like the United Nations would sort of govern everything. Is that the idea or something or, like the United Nations? Yeah, but, but buy-in. So for example, um, you know, I mean, if, if, if we're talking about an, if we're talking about all of the world's governments coming together and binding to a um, something, something akin to uh, an ecosystem, right. Where we're alleviating poverty, we're increasing, um, we're increasing uh, or, or decreasing inequity, right? You know, we're, we're, we're doing that. We're working uh, with the environment, like all of these types of things, right? No. Do you think that that is, um, do you think that's possible? I mean, I, and the reason why I ask you is because it's actually a really important, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, many philosophers have actually had to wrestle with this. Oh, yeah. Right. They've, they've had to think, you know, I mean, is it is it is, it, is it worthwhile endeavor to try and to have a, a, a whole um, like an overarching uh, governance? Is that even possible? Well, all right. Whether it's possible or not, I don't know. I'm like, it's not my core competency, so to speak. It's not my area of expertise. Whether it's worth striving for, I'd say yes. Because the more you can get people cooperating the more you get benefit for all concerned. Now, one of the interesting things is, I mean, it's this yin, yin yang thing. In a sense, no, there's always going to be some core of something fighting against what you're trying to build. But the effort of trying to build it is in itself a worthwhile endeavor. And actually, particularly if you're building it in such a way that you, you, 
get buy-in or attempt to get buy-in from all concerned. Well, that means you got to go talk to people, you got to listen to their concerns, you have to understand each other and so forth. That effort is worthwhile in itself. Those who participate in that, those who attempt to exert their power in that way, not in a power over way, but a power from within, a power of cooperatively working together, actually lead more satisfying lives, I think, than those who are just dominating. Yeah. I can't I can't believe that Putin's a very happy guy. You know, I don't think he's probably very He's probably not very contented with life. Um, I wouldn't want to be Putin. He's like, oh. <laughs> but if I were Putin and, if, and I could suddenly learn Russian, I would certainly turn the thing around as best as I could. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's it is it is really interesting. I think I've heard um, that in order to be uh, a statesman, to use a term that. Um, was translated for the, that dialogue that Plato wrote. Um, you know, it, it's um, it's very interesting to me that we've acknowledged that the statesman, at least in our our current condition, is is somebody that's uh, um, like borderline psychopathic. <laughs> like we like we say, I mean, we look at the American election, right? I mean, we we've got a lot of we, we've got a lot of people to choose from in a country of four hundred plus million people. And, and it's like, that's the best we've got. That's that like who stepped up to the plate. And, um, you know, I just think we could do better on both sides of the, well, the equation. You know, I'm sure we could. Uh, there's a, a there's a conundrum. It, it's, it's demonstrably. It's been, it's been demonstrated that people who cooperate mutually do better but there's always the the one non-cooperator who can you know short term do even better than anybody that is cooperating i'm trying to remember the there's a lot there's a lot of studies in in, in biology and populations and so forth i i have to i have to i have to put my hand up on that because i know exactly what you're talking about and it's, okay. it's, it's one of the I, I don't know specifically what it is either, but um, I mean, it would take, you know, probably 20 minutes, half an hour, or if I sat down to write a paper, that would be one of the actual fundamental defenses uh, that I have for Plato, actually, and the goodness in itself. And I know that's an aversion for you. So, but um, if you could just hear me out. So the idea is, is that exactly what you said, there's, there's a, a long-term benefit of cooperation over the long run. And so this is game theoretic. Right. This is uh, game theory that that shows that that's the way it is. Now, one of the competing forces in that sort of line of study is the um, and I and I basically summarize it as 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 Plato describing um, a uh, describing humanity in a way that is uh, the good always wins or prevails, so to speak. Right. You know, term. Right. Um, and we can have devastating. Uh, this is this is the dark side of, of human nature. Um, and one of the things that I like to uh, point people towards is the hawks and doves. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, that's an that's an interesting uh, study. Uh, but, yeah, the the um, you know, the 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 literature on altruism, which is kind of shaky. Right. It's it seems like we're trying to to get, get some proof behind uh, altruism, and it doesn't seem like it's entirely uh, successful. But the game theoretic of, in the long run, uh, the 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 cooperative behavior uh, wins out. It just yes. seems to be a description of the way we are as a new social species. So that's how I would. That's yeah, how I would. Is, social yeah. species, and um, yes, the whole thing about altruism. The, the more altruistic people you have in the society, the more altruistic birds in a bird society, whatever. There's opportunities for the non-altruistic, the selfish ones to grab more resources. But that provokes the altruists to become more able to detect the non-altruists. There's a term for non-altruism. I forget what it is. but And so there's a sort of escalation to get more uh, cheaters. They, they, 
the cooperator is getting better at detecting the cheaters. Okay, so the cheaters are diminished. And then, but then the cheaters try a different tactic and then, oh, they, they, can, they get more power and resources. But then the cooperators figure out how to detect them even better. So, okay, then it, they diminish, it goes back and forth. So in a sense, and this is really um, philosophically and sort of metaphysically and cosmologically, you've got yin and yang. You've got yang is the expansive, warm, yin is the cool, contractive. And reality is a balance of those two. It's not just a static balance, it's a dynamic balance. And that's what keeps the whole thing going. If there were only yang, whatever that would mean, or only yin, it'd be stasis, nothing would happen. So we're in a world where stuff happens because of this interplay of forces. So, so whether we like it or not, stuff potatoes, we here we are, you know, we gotta learn how to deal with it. So so to use um you know bill framing, okay. Um or I'll, or I'll say the the Meacham mechanism. Meacham mechanism. <laughs> I just have, oh, good. I'm just having fun with this, right? So yeah, let me tell, the, tell me what the, that is. <laughs> but the overarching power, the overarching power is that that is that is the mechanism that's getting things done. That is the overarching power. Well, the way, but the overarching power is this interplay between forces. The, the Meacham mechanism there. <laughs> I don't think I could take credit for it. But okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You, you know, and and we'd have to think. You know, like um, it's it's not so much the credit. It's it's um, let's let's talk about contribution. Like how how would and 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 you almost can't look at it from a a standpoint of I need to novel. To, I need to apply some sort of novelty to this in order to, you know, differentiate my views in order to, um, you know, take, take that idea and then have it re be recognized as, as the Meacham mechanism, right? It just, if it's, if, if it's really just reiterating a yin and yang, then there's nothing new being brought to that equation or description, right? And so um, what I think happens is that you know, as philosophers or, or or thinkers, if there's something that we can contribute that is new and novel, or um, you know, then then it somehow we we um, find our place in uh, the edifice of academia. You know, of of at least the voices that are heard for generations to come. Right? You know, like standing on the Newtonian giants. Right? Would you agree with that? Um. Well, yes, in this interplay of yin and yang, it's not just, it, well, there's, there's a couple, historically, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Some people look at it as a cycle. We go around and around and we're just places in the cycle. And spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, same thing over and over again. But we in the West have learned that this. I've learned to look at it as not just a cycle, but as a spiral. Each time around, something new happens. And, and maybe it's a spiral upwards, and maybe it's a spiral downwards. We hope it's upwards. But there is always the, the potential for something new, something unexpected, something that hasn't been done before. It's all within the context of the yin and yang and the balance of forces and so forth. There's always something, something new. And that seems to be a feature of reality as we as we know it that it's not just the same damn thing over and over again it's something new each time so one of the ways that people who think about stuff philosophers can help is by identifying the newness identifying the conditions under which the novelty can emerge and be nurtured such that more and more benefit happens to for more and more people but also more and more plants and animals and birds and fishes and the whole the whole world mm, yeah we are we are we are queerance that that that, that seek out novelty that that's that's interesting mm -hmm. yeah i i was looking at um 
there's one of the platonic dialogues that I was looking at. And if I think if I pause enough, I can actually think which one it was. Um, well, I'll move on because I don't want, I don't want to waste uh, you know the time for anybody that's that's listening. Um, but the the idea is is that uh, oh, it was the one dialogue where where Plato is uh, or sorry Socrates is uh, is young. So it's a uh, is it Parmenides? I think I don't remember. Uh, anyway, so um, the idea is is that our knowledge or not only our knowledge, but our wisdom starts to change with age, right? So, um, yeah, we hope it increases, <laughs> but yes, or certainly on now that we, we know more, I know more now than I used to know back when I was younger, whether yeah, I'm wiser or not, I hope so, but yeah, but and the points you were trying to make is that the naivety, the naive, the, the naiveness of, a younger generation that searches that, that searches out novelty, mm -hmm. however important for our society. When you start to get older, you start to realize. Now, the Parmidian the Parmidian uh, observation is that we 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 go to uh, like flux, like you know, it becomes much more relativistic or unpredictable, mm -hmm. right? And so, when you're younger, you have all these ideas of being able to make connections and pull things together. But as you get older, um, I don't know if it's like a natural inborn disposition towards being either skeptical or, yeah, we've seen that before, or it's not going to happen. And so like, wait, my young Socrates, when you get older, you realize that this is not, <laughs> these are lofty goals that just, it's, it's nice to think about, but you know, the true fact of the way the world works is that it doesn't come together so nicely as you, as you'd like to think. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. But um, fortunately, we keep having more young people because if we if we stifled that creative impulse to make something new, then we would be ossified and sclerosed and just kind of boring. Right. So even though the young people, and I used to be one of them, and you know, <laughs> I know how it is. Uh, we want to make the world better and we're going to do it. We're going to whatever, however we're going to do it. Um, so it runs up against reality and it doesn't quite work, but it does make it incrementally better. Mm. I can remember when there were, it was, it was a, a new thing that black people and white people ought to be more equal. It's like the civil rights movement in the U S and there was the opposition and fighting and conflict and all kinds of stuff. And so we say, well, it still didn't work. There's still institutional racism and people are, but I walk down the street and I see black people and I see white people, people in my neighborhood. There's a house full of black people and there's houses full of uh, Hispanics, Chicanos and white people. It's like, Somehow it's, and I see there's more interracial couples. It's just more accepted, even though there was, there is this conflict and we're not all the way where we like to be. We're better than we used to be. There's um, the relationships between men and women. Um, for the longest time, there, 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 there was way back when there was a Port Huron statement, which is the initial statement by SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, that started the whole new left thing. And it's all about man this and man that, and man wants to maximize his potential and the society's getting in the way. It's all masculine language. And nowadays, that's, like, that's just archaic and weird, but, um, and there's still lots of ways in which women earn less than men and they're oppressed and so forth, but it's better than it used to be. And if we had not gone out there and tried to make social change, it, w it wouldn't be better. It w wouldn't, have, wouldn't have made as much difference. So I guess my point is that even though the lofty ideals of the young didn't quite come to fruition, things got better anyway. We didn't quite get to where we wanted to be, but we got better than where we used to be. Mm. That makes sense. 
Yeah, I haven't thought about FDS for a long time, actually. And I, I hadn't thought of it being uh, a significant part of the whole that is now defined as the left. And that's really interesting that those that that root uh, or that that it has that history uh, that 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 the the liberal tradition actually has that that history from Vietnam. Oh yeah, there was a, the new left. And there's always the left for a while, but this is the new left, and we're going to radically change things around. And it worked for a while. I mean, and like I say, we we definitely um, made some changes. So again, it's a cyclic, cyclical thing. The new left made a lot of changes, and then the old right kind of took over. And I mean, now in the states, we have it looks like the twenty or thirty or forty years of of legalized abortion is maybe going to go away. Like the the old guard, the the conservatives are have taken. Very good about taking over the, the courts, mm. and things are swinging back the other way. Well, they'll swing back the other way, and then after a while, they swing back. Just goes back and forth. But as I, I say, that you can sit there and just twiddle your thumbs and look at it, but it's more engaging and more rewarding to get in there and try to make something happen. Well, that's really interesting. I don't know how, as a philosopher, how much you're. Um, aware of uh hegel um you know hegel i've read a teeny bit of hegel and he goes he doesn't make any sense to me he doesn't make much sense but i know the thesis antithesis synthesis thing but go ahead what about hegel well just the cyclical nature of i mean so i mean he, he'd be boring and you seem to go back to a a, a yin yang but the cyclical nature um and the patterns in history are really mm -hmm. are really interesting um uh you know, as as a as a framing, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think as long as it doesn't come in a deterministic container, <laughs> but okay. then it it almost introduces a metaphysics of sorts, right? So it's I I don't know I'm 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 a, I'm becoming a little bit disenfranchised with a lot of the recent philosophers as just a um, however great they are, uh, they they seem to recapitulate rebrand things that we already knew. I mean, here you are going back to something uh, like yin and yang. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you, you don't have to evoke the gods of Wittgenstein or, or Heidegger or a continental tradition. Heck, we haven't done anything analytical in the conversation, right? We've advocated oh. for uh, a group dynamic of actually listening to people. And I raise my hand and say, what about wisdom? Been out you, before. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's. I guess we can hurry up and analyze something. Wisdom. What about wisdom? What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to put your knowledge to good use. You have lots of knowledge about how things work. You have way better knowledge about how the physical universe works than the Greeks who were in, like, in the, oh, there's earth, air, fire, and water. Well, we know a whole lot more about that than, than the ancient Greeks did. Do we know much more about how to get along with each other and how to live a fulfilled life? That's what wisdom is, being able to put your knowledge to good use. And by good, I mean beneficial uh, mm -hmm. in a way that promotes health and well-being. And on the material plane, we've got lots and lots. We've got medicine. We've got lots of food. We've got all kinds of stuff, which is clearly an advance over the agriculture of the ancient Greeks. And I think we talked about this last time, the ideals of the of Aristotelian, the ideal of the, the philosopher who's at the pinnacle of human excellence only worked for the owning class. The, the Athens was run by gentlemen farmers they had their estates of agriculture and they were wealthy enough to get together and have enough leisure time to debate in the agro about stuff and um, have votes and you know govern themselves and that was a, a, a big advance but we now have advanced farther it's not just uh, 
it's not just the gentleman farmers and the gentleman industrialists or whatever. We want, we're at least attempting to get everybody involved, uh, disadvantaged as well as the advantaged. So that's an advance in, in, in uh, promoting a beneficial society for everybody. Now you've still got the old guard, you know, the, the rich and the wealthy and the powerful that want to keep things the way they were. And the way they do that is to promote falsehoods and play to people's fears. And, and it just goes on and on. But as I say, it's more rewarding to be on the side of the, of the, of the good than it is on the side of the evil. Uh -huh. I could bite on that, but I'm going to leave that one alone. Because this is your show. <laughs> it's our show. You're the one. You're the one. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I know. But I love. I love. I love. I love the opportunity to listen to Bill. Really, right? That's really what what this is about. So, um, <laughs> what is the uh, okay? What is the like? I want to. I want to spend the rest. You know, the last ten minutes. I want to really, really dig into the concept of nuclear here because we're I'm not. Sorry, the concept of of what? Of, of nuclear deterrence oh okay okay because you know we're not we're not dealing with um you know we can imagine a superpower without nuclear without the nuclear bat or threat behind uh and and the potential of escalation right mm -hmm. i mean if 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 um if, if putin didn't have uh, a nuclear threat uh, mm. the ability to push the button, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I think our response would be quite different. Our collective, the West yeah. response would be quite right. different. Right. And so then it, that it becomes the elephant in the room for, well, we don't, we, you know, we don't, we don't want to piss them off. We don't want to escalate. We don't want to. Um, and. Yeah. That's why we're doing economic sanctions instead of, shooting missiles into russia yeah yeah well i don't and I, I, to what point well the the point of power over uh -huh. when a power is to get things done the point of power over is to is the person who wants to be dominating attempts to make the other one bend to their will so so we're trying to get putin to stop his his advance into Ukraine. Putin's trying to take over Ukraine. There's two power overs. Mm. And as long as you've got somebody exercising power over, um, I mean, like, this is where I get a little, a little hazy. I'm not an expert. It seems like you've got to stand up to it in some way. If we were to try to just reason with, oh, reason with Putin, oh, uh, Vladimir, hey, you're, you're, you're going about this in not a very smart way. We can do it better. I mean, if he were amenable with that kind of reason, we would, we would do it. But he's not. So we've got to stand up to him in some way. And there's this, and so we can't actually shoot down Russian planes over Ukraine. <clears throat> well, we can we can send anti-aircraft stuff to the Ukrainians, and they can shut down the Russian planes. But if NATO starts shooting down Russian planes, then Russia starts shooting down NATO's planes and it just escalates. So right. that's why we're trying to do economic sanctions and make it hard for hard for Putin to do what he wants without military force. Yeah. It's I, it's more complicated than I am able to really deal with. Really sad in a way. I mean uh, Very sad. Uh, I've I've heard some people say that we're already in in a version of World War Three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know the reality of it is, is that it is it is economic, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, I, I one of my one of my favorite recent discoveries is a quote from Albert Einstein where he was asked asked to predict the uh, the types of weapons used in World War Three. Oh, wow! What did he say? He goes, that I don't know, but I know that World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And and right. for me, this is uh this is really great because it has uh a chilling like effect that Einstein was, you know, just 
feels Einsteinian in a way, like taking it and looking and extrapolating past it and then picking mm. the most important piece. Um, and I think he's really, really right. There's a lot of wisdom in there that's, you know, there, there's, there's a warning uh, in those words that um, if we go down this road, you know, it's a, uh, it's a return to, it's uh, the great reset on the cycles that you're describing, that we've been describing on the show today, mm -hmm. a great reset to something more akin to hunter gathering. Uh, you could say, mm -hmm. like Mad Max, you know, like uh, yeah. and 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 what a world to live in. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about the way the new generation is born is they don't know, they don't they don't know what it's like. So. In a generation after the collapse and the fall of Rome, did the Goths and the uh, you know the the factions that emerged in and throughout uh, Europe and Eurasia did they ha have an idea what what it was like to live in Rome? Uh, not really, you know. <laughs> did they experience any happiness or joy? Probably, you know, um, and. You know, what, what was it that brought us back to structure, uh, to, to fight against the chaotic nature of, of a, uh, a society that is out for themselves, that is out for short-term gain and out to take advantage of other people? Um, okay. that's, that's something that... Uh, a theol somebody who studies theology would say that that is the will of God. That is the human nature that's moving in the direction of uh, an ultimate good. Right. Okay. And there's lots of indications that we are moving in that direction, but it's not just an easy path. Mm -hmm. Something you've got to exert. There's a certain value in exerting your power and and mastering your life and mastering your environment such that you can actually get things done there's a certain value in that there's a certain satisfaction well if you didn't have any oppositions the yin and yang thing again if you didn't have, if you didn't have yang for yin to push against then nothing would happen so it's just it's part of the nature of reality that that forces go back and forth in a sort of cyclical but also spiral way spiral is toward more complexity and more more richness of satisfaction more richness of experience for more and more people even though along the way we get things like mario paul and off the awful stuff that's happening in Ukraine. That's beautiful, uh, beautifully said. And I want to introduce you to um, another Plank Sip uh, contributor. His name um, he has a he has a site called SpiralInquiry.org. His name's George Gantz. Yeah, I'm going to introduce him to you, uh, you know, by a, by email after okay. the episode. Yeah. Um, I think he's starting a podcast series and he's really focusing on complexity. Uh, but I think you get the concept of what he's he's doing with this um, idea of of spiral and spiral inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a little all over the country. I think he 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 does a lot with the the Boston Long Now Society and mm -hmm. bringing in complexity into conversations. So um, I'm excited cool. to see what you know you know what can what can blossom out of out of that relationship. I think you really like him. He's a really really good mm -hmm. guy. Um, maybe we yeah. could do a three-way video thing sometime. Ah, maybe the next, uh, yeah, that would be a good introduction for maybe next month. Uh, see if he's available and then maybe you can do a, uh, a one-on-one -on -one in his series. That'd be, that'd be kind of cool. See. Okay. Yeah. Right. Until next time, Bill. Okay. Nice Thank you, Daniel. To you. you betcha. Okay. okay bye. Bye.